This week's project is known as a basket weave illusion. It's a pattern that's going to look like a basket weave, but it is an illusion. And also, the video is going to focus more on how I did the basket weave itself, the jigs I used to create it, and less on the actual making of the platter, as I've covered that on a couple videos now. So the woodworm screw is mounted in what will be the top of this platter. I didn't, again, not showing a lot of detail here, uh, just quickly showing the shaping of the platter and then we'll get into the embellishment. So here I'm shaping the bottom of the ball. I'm using my ball gouge and just doing the same techniques that you've seen on my channel many times before. Uh, just doing some push cuts, trying to get as smooth as finish as I can. For this bowl, as you can see, I want a nice wide rim, and it is a shallow bowl, so I'm just shaping it the best that I can, making it bowl shaped uh, in beyond the rim. Here I'm switching to my negative rig scraper just to give me a nice smooth surface, and then once that's been complete, you can see here it's pretty smooth. I'll just refine the details around what's going to be the foot of this platter. And then eventually that tenon that you see there up against my live center will be uh, reverse chucked and removed. I think I've discussed this before, but for me and my progress as a turner, this has made the difference between uh, beginning and advancing. And that is spending the time with the scraper, the negative rake scraper, the round nose scraper to remove any marks. Yes, they can be sanded out, but the time you spent scraping and getting a good finish is well worth it, and it's going to eliminate a lot of sanding time. Now that that's done, I'm just applying a abrasive paste here. I've already applied a sanding sealer off camera, but I'm applying my abrasive paste, and uh, again, just finishing the bottom of this bowl completely. Now, I didn't show all the beading, but this is my this is my beading tool. And I showed this on a previous video, see if you can see that there. So it is a carbide uh, beading tool, so it, it sets the shape, and it also sets the distance between these two points. But I did have a little problem with tear out, and this wood is actually a butternut, so it's a bit prone to tear out. Probably not as much as the last piece that I did in my last video. That uh, If you haven't had an opportunity to see that, I encourage you to go back and look. But what I did in this case is made sure that I did a few fundamentals right. Number one, I put this on my tool rest and held it parallel to the floor so that it wouldn't dig in, which would help reduce tear out. The other thing is push slowly, let the tool do the work, don't drive it in quickly. The other thing that I did this time around uh, is I just used the beading tool to set the space. And uh, then I switched to my skew to actually do the rounding over to do the majority of the cutting as opposed to doing it all with scraping. And then once I completed that, then I went back with the beading tool just to refine the shape a little bit more. At that point, it would have been removing very little material, but just been even, would just even out any irregularities from the skew chisel. And that seemed to do a good job. And uh, I was quite pleased, at least with how the beading tool made the spacing quite easy. So here's a good view of the beads. I ended up with six rows of beads uh, on the rim of my platter. And now I'm taking a piece of Formica. It's actually a sample that you get from your local hardware store. Uh, the good thing about them is they're free. And uh, they can be used to burn the uh, lines in the bowl. So I just hold the piece of Formica and you can see here I've got the speed turned up fairly high and I press fairly hard and you can see the smoke coming off as it's just friction and it ends up burning those lines in and you can see how much it does burn it and really 
distinguishes those individual rings. As I had mentioned earlier, I used my beaded carbide tool to, uh, to do these beads around the rim, but I stopped a little bit short because I didn't want to get the tear out that I'd experienced the week before. If you're interested in seeing that video, I'd encourage you to go take a look at it. So what I did this time, as I mentioned, I used the beading tool to get my spacing, but then I went back with the skew chisel and just use the tip of the skew chisel to round over those beads. And uh, it did a really good job at doing a better definition of the beads. As you can see here, I just used the tip of the skew chisel and I went down each side of the bead going down into the bottom where I had previously burned. And a skew chisel is a different type of uh, tool, it will cut, whereas this beading tool is more of a scrape, even though it is a negative rake. So once I went over it with the skew, then I went back with the beading tool just to provide a much more uniform shape to the beads. So here is a indexing wheel that I made for my lathe. I have a laser engraver, so I printed this out on a piece of plywood. And it's just a circle that's marked off with degrees. Uh, the first major unit there is five degrees, but it's actually marked out in the finer ring on the outside is in single degrees. And uh, I then cut the center piece out so that I could mount this behind my chuck. Now with my indexing wheel mounted behind my chuck, uh, I also mounted a board up against my lathe with an index line on it. So all I need to do is turn the bowl to the point at which it matches up with the line that I want. So here's a shot of the complete jig in place. Again, you can see the indexing wheel and the backing board, which is clamped down to my lathe bed. The other thing about that is that backing board is pushed fairly tight up against the indexing wheel just to provide a little bit of friction so that it holds it in place as I rotate it it will stay in that place until I make the mark. Full disclosure my lathe actually has a built-in indexing capability to it but it's done with a pin that you have to screw into place so by the time you screw it in rotate it screw it back in uh, it takes it's very time consuming, so this jig that I made is much quicker and much simpler to use and also provides a greater degree of flexibility. Now here you can see the bowl mounted in the chuck with the jig in the background. And here I'm just showing the Teflon slide that I made that rides on my tool rest. One of the advantages of this over others I've seen designed online is that I can mark both sides of the bowl at the same time. What I mean by that is being able to do both sides without adjusting the angle setting. I missed this detail earlier and I just wanted to show the profile and how my Teflon block worked. I cut a profile to match that of my tool rest so it can freely slide all the way across the tool rest. It's also designed so that when a pencil is sitting on top of the block, it will be at center line of the piece of work. Here you can see the pencil marks that I've made on the bowl. They are every five degrees. So there's a total of 72 marks around the rim of the bowl. With this indexing wheel, I'm not limited in any way. Uh, because I'm marked even to the degree, I can pick the number of divisions that I want. But in this case, 72 worked out well. It gave me a good size segment uh, for the pattern that I wanted to do. So once I have it all marked, I remove the bowl from the lathe 
and I used my pyrography uh, pen, wood burning pen, to mark the radial lines that I drew with the pencil. And I just go across each one of these pencil lines and burn those into the wood. Typically what I would do is I would drag it straight across following the pencil line and then go back in and make sure that I got down into the valley uh, of each bead to make sure that I had a good continuous burn on each of these radial lines. This process is a bit time consuming and it took me about an hour to go around the bowl uh, burning all the radial lines. Here you can see the completed burning pattern and I've burnt each and every one of the lines and now I'll be ready to begin the coloring process. I forgot there's one more thing to do before I start coloring. I want to remove the inside of the bowl and also clean up the very outside edge. The reason for this is I don't want any sawdust getting into the material once I've colored it. So I'm just using my skew chisel here on the edge just to take that outer rim down a little bit. I left it a little proud to start with while I was doing the burning. But now that that's complete, I want to take it down a little bit, actually a bit below the beads. So I'm just using my skew chisel and uh, rounding that over and taking it down a little bit. So I won't show it all. You've seen this lots of times before. But I'm going to sand the inside of this bowl from 80 grit up to 600. I'm going to apply sanding sealer and then my polishing paste. And this inside of the bowl will be complete. Now I'm going to leave the rim raw, untouched, because we're going to do some embellishment on that. And I want that to be able to soak into the wood. As I mentioned, I'm going to be doing a basket weave illusion on the rim of this bowl. And the first thing I did was I designed my pattern. I designed it myself and I used Excel. And just within Excel started uh, playing around with some colors. In this case, I'm going to do three colors plus the, the raw wood for a total of four. And I just made a pattern that was repeating and that looked like something that I'd want to put on the rim of this roll bowl. Uh, it has 72 segments, so I had to make it a multiple of 6 or 12 so that the pattern would be repeatable. And this is what I ended up with. So this part of the video, I'm not going to show a lot of detail just because it's difficult to see. I'm working in a very tight space. But I'm using, in this case, Sharpie markers. I think any alcohol-based marker is all that's required. I have my laptop here, which has the uh, pattern that I can reference. And then what I do is I go through, and I just put a dot in each square in the appropriate color. That way I can go back and color them in, in completely, but having the dot there, at least I have the pattern to go by. And just full disclosure, this took over an hour for me to just get the pattern established on the rim uh, and then I had to go back in and color it in a little more detail. But you can see here uh, how the pattern is starting to develop and again it's a bit tedious. I've got to make sure that the pattern is matching what I have on my spreadsheet. So here's the finished product. It took about three hours. I went around it once, then back over it again to fill in any spots. And I probably did this two or three times, finding little tiny spots each time that I colored in. And sometimes when I colored in a little spot, I'd get a little tiny bit of bleed through. I'd have to clean it off and then redo that piece. So in total, about three hours to do this band. The center of this bowl has been treated with my abrasive paste and polish. So I just put a little bit more triple E wax on it and uh, that was all I did for the center. 
I just went over the edge as well where the beading was very lightly with my triple E wax just to polish it up a bit before I applied the first coat of finish. After applying the triple E compound, then I applied a white diamond paste, which is just that much finer. Applied that to the center of the bowl and then just very, very lightly around the outside. That last polishing wheel did leave behind some fine threads, so I just used my air nozzle to blow it off to make sure that there wasn't anything trapped down inside the beading pattern. Here you can see that I've taped off the center of the bowl because I'm going to put a spray lacquer over the beading just to seal it. And you can see here the spray lacquer that I used. And I didn't want to put this on the bowl itself because it already had a nice finish just from the abrasive paste, polish, and the wax that was applied. I ended up putting a couple coats of lacquer on this uh, before I finished. So here's the finished product. It's a butternut platter, which is 12 inches in diameter. And the beading around the outside is about 3 inches in width. I ended up using four different colors, black, red, blue, and then some of the squares I actually left just natural. Hopefully you enjoyed this project. I was pleased with the way it turned out. It's a fun project to do, although a bit tedious at times. And if those are interested, this bowl is for sale.